Hey, how's it going? I'm Jimmy Tart. I'm an educator with the Utah Avalanche Center. Uh, I also work professionally as a ski guide for Park City Powder Cats, cat skiing operation, our hometown team here in Park City. Woo! Uh, I also work as a guide and forecaster for Majestic Heli Ski in Alaska and an educator for Silverton Avalanche School out of Silverton, Colorado. Um, I was a ski patroller for 15 years. So uh, what we're doing here tonight, uh, it looks like the backcountry is going to be a really busy place this year. So uh, Utah Avalanche Center is making a really big push to bring education to people. So rather than having you have to come to us to get one of these talks, here we are on Instagram Live bringing the information to you. So what this talk is, the Know Before You Go program was created in 2004 after an avalanche accident uh, not too far from here over in Provo Canyon where a couple of young men were killed in an avalanche on a high danger day. Uh, after the accident, uh, we realized that these young men had no idea about avalanches or avalanche danger or anything like that. So after that, Craig Gordon created this presentation uh, designed to be easily taken out to, to schools or wherever uh, to bring a little bit of knowledge to people and hopefully drive them towards some classes and get some formal av avalanche education. So rolling into this, uh, it's important to know too that this, the Know Before You Go talk, it's not just a Utah thing. This was, this was created with input from professionals all over the country. Uh, so no matter where you are, this talk is going to be uh, really relevant to you. You could be in Colorado, shout out if you're in Colorado. You could be up in Montana, Alaska, wherever. But uh, yeah, uh, it'll be good for you. So uh, if, you're, if you're watching this, I would say it's pretty safe to say that you love to play on the snow. I mean, I certainly do. I, I think uh, last year was a little bit different of a season, but some of my years I'm getting in 200 plus days on the snow. Uh, those of you who came to the snow from the beach, you can probably go to the beach and look out and see riptides and stuff. I go to the beach and all I can think of, I saw jaws at a really impressionable age. So like that's all I can think about. I just see giant sharks everywhere. But if you grew up on the beach, you can probably look out there and just by looking at the waves and stuff, you're going to be able to see where riptides are and sandbars and stuff like that. Well, here in the mountains, with avalanches being the big danger, it's the same way. You've got to get a little trained up on what to look for. So, you know, the, the, the problem being some of these signs are a little bit more subtle. Uh, we'll talk about them a little bit in, in this, you know, in this live stream, but I definitely encourage you get some formal education, and we'll get more to that on later, uh, more on that later. One of the things you'll learn in uh, a level one class or level two class if you've already taken a level one is there's actually a lot of different kinds of avalanches. I like to think of avalanches a lot, that they're a lot like cakes, mostly because I like thinking about cake. But uh, there's all kinds of different cakes, right? You could have a red velvet cake, you could have a German chocolate cake. They all have a lot of things in common that are basics, you know, like flour, sugar, eggs, stuff like that. But when you put all the ingredients in the recipe together in slightly different ways, you get a slightly different end product. Well, avalanches are the same way. So the term avalanche can cover everything from a loose snow avalanche to a slab avalanche to a wet avalanche, and sometimes they're dry avalanches. There's a lot of different terms, a lot of different specific types of avalanche that that one word covers. So if you didn't know that, find out more about it in the next class you take. The basics, though, of all avalanches, like if to make the cake analogy again, like most cakes are going to have some kind of flour and eggs in them, but all avalanches, one of the things they share in common is strong snow over weak snow. So that's something that when, uh, you know, it looks like maybe even next week we're going to start getting snow here throughout the West. Uh, next week, start looking into things like strong snow and weak snow and see if you can find them outside. Um, the strong snow and weak snow can come from different processes, too. Uh, one of the most common ways that we get really strong snow that's got really tightly bonded grains is from wind effect. Uh, settlement can also do that. Uh, weak snow comes from a couple different ways, too. Lightly fallen snow with no wind is going to be very weak. It's easy to blow that powder off in your hand because the bonds in between them are really weak. 
Cold, clear nights, too, can also produce this kind of weak snow through a process called faceting. I'm not going to dive deep into that because there's a lot of science in there, and it just doesn't look good when I try and explain it. So where do avalanches occur? Well, they could occur on almost any aspect and any elevation. But the one thing you're always going to have in common is slope angle. A uh, really important thing to be able to know how to do in the backcountry is how to be able to measure slope angle. There's a lot of different tools out there. I carry a slope inclinometer on, on me every day that I go ski in the backcountry. It doesn't even live in my pack. It lives in my pocket so I can get it out real easily. Uh, there's also great online resources such as if you're, if you're one of our local Wasatch skiers and know the Wasatch backcountry skiing uh, desktop map, it's fantastic. There's slope angles in there. There's another website, CalTopo, that is uh, what I prefer to use for uh, measuring slope angles, Gaia, the list goes on and on. But all avalanches are going to have something in common, and that's going to be slope angle. Most of them occur between 30 and about 30 and 45 degrees. So I tell people, start training your eyes up, even when you're skiing at the ski area, to look for slope angles of 30 to 45 degrees. Uh, it's most of, most of our experiences with avalanches, if you're a recreational skier, you've probably seen a lot of avalanches on videos uh, where professionals are skiing in you know, Alaska or Canada or someplace like that, and they show these giant, massive avalanches chasing them down. Well, the fact is that size doesn't really matter. Small avalanches can be just as dangerous as the large avalanches. Here in Utah, we've seen a lot of fatalities over the years out of avalanches of the smallest sizes. So again, slope angle is what you need to look out for, not necessarily size. So going back to the videos that we've all watched a lot of people skiing in Alaska, well, the people you're watching get paid to go ski in Alaska, to go heli-ski with cameras in Alaska because they're the top, top tenth of 1% of skiers and boarders in the world. They're the best in the world. Yeah, that's not most of us. I've been around a lot of avalanches and you can't just ski out of them. That's just not really the way it works. So what happens if you do get caught in one? Well, the feeling of getting the floor yanked out from under you really quickly. It's kind of like when you run as fast as you can onto one of those moving sidewalks, like at the airport. Yeah, things start happening really fast and your odds of being able to just stay on your feet are really slim. Once you're, once you're off your feet and moving with the debris flow, now you've got things like possibly trees to contend with, which the idea of reaching out and grabbing a tree yeah, I mean, that's a fantastic idea, but try it next time you're driving in a car. Imagine reaching out your window at, you know, 30 miles an hour and grabbing a tree and holding on to it. It doesn't work. You know, so that's what trees are. They're just big baseball bats. Let's say there's cliffs and rocks. You're going to get raked over those and just beat to a pulp. Let's say you are, let's say you manage to miss all the trees and all the rocks, and you know, fortunately in Utah we don't have crevasses, but we do in Alaska, and those terrify me. But let's say you make it to the bottom in one piece. Well, as the debris flow is running out, you're not the heaviest, you're a heavy, low, uh, low surface area object. You're gonna settle out towards the bottom of the debris flow. It's, you know, if you've never been in an avalanche, it, you know, after 20 years as a professional, I can say, yeah, I've been in some avalanches. It's not a cool feeling. It feels really bad. Hopefully, you've got good partners who have been training their partner rescue skills, and they can come down and get you as fast as they can. But start thinking about this in terms of time. How long is it going to take your partners to make sure the scene's safe? 30 seconds? Maybe a minute? How long is it going to take them to activate the EMS system by calling 911? Well, okay, there's another minute right there, let's say, if they do it quickly. How long is it going to take them to travel down the bed surface of that avalanche path? Ooh, depends on the size of the path, but that could easily be another couple minutes. Well, how good are their beacon skills? Have they been practicing? You see how this time could definitely start adding up? 
uh, it adds up real fast. It's one thing to have all these, you know, intentions of skiing some powder and maybe even intentions of like doing a good rescue, but the fact is it can take a really long time. There's been so, there was a, a data set that was collected in Switzerland, uh, let's see, 2004, so coming on 15 years ago, that uh, looked at burial times versus survivability rates uh, in avalanches. It was in Switzerland. Uh, they, they have a lot of government uh, funding there to do a lot of really cool research, and that's where it came from. But what they found out was that after about 15 minutes of burial, your odds of surviving an avalanche drop into single-digit territory. Um, it's, it's a really tough thing to rescue somebody out of an avalanche, and that's with good skills. Um, the, the reason being, uh, it comes down to extrication, really. Let's say, let's say your partners are the best beacon searchers in the country. They've been training. They, they find you. They travel down through the debris field, and they get to you, and they, do, they nail their beacon search, and they're on you in four minutes. Well, Without oxygen, human brain cells start dying in about four minutes, so you're already probably starting to black out, so you're not gonna be conscious at this point. So they've, they've done their pinpoint search, and they know where you are, and they get their shovels out, and they start digging. Average depth for uh, avalanche fatality, average depth of burial in North America is about two meters. To dig somebody out, to extricate an average size adult out of two meters of snow, you're gonna have to move about 2,000 pounds of snow. How long is that gonna take? Kind of bad statistics, but what I want everybody to get out of this is that the key to surviving avalanches isn't to be the gnarliest rider in the world, it's to just not get in one in the first place. Um, um, you know, uh, some more statistics, because coming, like, who are we kidding? Like, no presentation is complete without at least like some talk of like graphs and slides and statistics. 73% um, of all fatalities are asphyxia from asphyxiation, which that goes to show you about how uh, problematic and how difficult real avalanche rescue can be. Only about 25% are from trauma, uh, which leaves another 2% that sadly are uh, fatalities due to exposure, hypothermia really that usually these were people skiing by themselves who it might have been a survivable accident but died from exposure. Scary stuff. That was a lot of bad news. That, that was all like grim stuff. You could see this look on my face where I was just like, hmm. Here's a little bit of good news. This is something to bring you back up a little bit. 93% of all avalanche accidents uh, were avalanches caused by, triggered by somebody in the, the victim or somebody in their group, which like at first glance, that sounds really bad. That's a really high number. But what that means is we actually have a lot of control over our own fate. It's our personal and group decision-making processes that lead to these accidents. But now that you know that, with a little bit of education, you can learn the, the, some tricks and skills to offset those uh, heuristic traps, keep you a lot safer in the backcountry. You know, sometimes in uh, mainstream media reporting after an avalanche accident, they kind of make it seem like maybe the avalanche kind of struck without warning. The avalanches aren't dragons lurking under bridges waiting for innocent people to cross them. There's a lot we can do to help prevent these accidents from happening to us in the first place. So this is step one in the education. Let's keep going. So nearly all avalanche ha accidents happen in the backcountry too. Um, you know, I say nearly because the, I mean, the odds are one in the hundreds of millions of being in an avalanche accident in bounds in open terrain at a resort. It's something that I could uh, go on for a long time about, but I won't. Um, in bounds at a resort, you're probably gonna be pretty safe. Uh, ski patrols and ski area avalanche forecasters do a huge amount of work to make sure that these areas are safe to ski as long as you're in open areas. Um, I'll talk more about the signage at ski areas. Hmm? Yeah? Pay attention to them. These are great signs that you should probably not be in an area. But uh, back to the subject, nearly all avalanche accidents happen outside the resorts. 
Here in Utah, uh, we're pretty lucky. We have a lot of great ski areas that also have great backcountry access right next to them. So it's super easy to just pop out a gate and go ski in the backcountry. It, it can be a little bit of a troublesome thing though. You know, we get used to riding around in these ski areas and seeing this adjacent terrain and it becomes very familiar. Well, the ski patrollers weren't out and out, up and out the door at 5.30 in the morning to go put some, uh, put some shots into those adjacent areas. Uh, there's, no, uh, there's no DOT teams with howitzers shooting them to make them safe for skiing. Um, that work doesn't happen in the backcountry. So whether or not you see these adjacent areas all the time, it doesn't mean they're necessarily safe. It's a completely different environment once you go out those gates. Um, so here I've got the number, 12% of avalanche fatalities occur after leaving the resort boundaries. Um, that's, that's, 12 that's a 12% that we could easily make a smaller number with, with a little bit of education. Um, you know, there's, there's signage, the information on the, the avalanche danger in the backcountry is available. There's forecast centers all over the country that their sole mission is to get you the information you need to make those decisions that are gonna keep you safe in the backcountry. Talk more on that in just a little bit. So to start, uh, start laying out a path to the future for, for your uh, safety in the backcountry, I'm gonna start with one thing, get the gear. This is the easy part of the whole equation. So by gear, uh, you know, I'll talk more about it in a second, but there's a couple pieces of basic safety gear that are mandatory every time you go in the backcountry. It's not just good enough to have the gear, you gotta know how to use it, so you gotta get the training. It's not just get the training and knowing and how to use your gear, but how, knowing how to keep yourself from needing to use it. Uh, get the forecast. Like I said a second ago, there's forecast centers all over the country that are dying to get you the knowledge. Um, you can go to avalanche.org. Uh, if you're watching from any place else, if you live in Colorado, you can go to the Colorado Avalanche Information Center. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're all over. You can get uh, from avalanche.org to whatever part of the country you need to. Even if you're doing a trip to someplace else, let's say you live in Colorado and are going to Jackson, you could get to go to avalanche.org and you can find a link to the Bridger Teton Avalanche Center, for instance. Get the picture. I talk about get the picture as put all these things together. There's kind of a lot going on and there's a lot of different aspects to avalanche safety, but it's possible to do. Um, you don't focus on any one piece of it at any one time. You gotta put everything together to get the picture. And the last one is get out of harm's way. It's, there, there are some kind of general rules of backcountry safety that are kind of more like etiquette, like don't stand around at the bottom of a slide path. But I also, I think of it as some days it's just not the day to go out there. Um, on high hazard days, I would rather go ski moguls than get caught in an avalanche. So getting out of harm's way can be just as simple as staying, to the, staying at the resort. So let's talk about the gear for a second. Uh, basic, the three basic pieces of avalanche gear that I have with me on every single trip, every time I go into the backcountry, I always carry a transceiver, a probe, and a shovel. Uh, these are all really specific items, but without, it's like a three-legged stool. Without one of those items, you're gonna fall over, it's not gonna work. Uh, your transceiver is gonna lead you to the general area of where your friend's buried. Probe's gonna tell you exactly where he's buried. Shovel gets him unburied and leads to them being able to breathe again. So transceiver, probe, and shovel. Never leave home without it. Some ancillary gear too that uh, I like to think of this stuff as buying more lottery tickets, right? Like, you know, like uh, statisticians tell us that the odds of us winning the lottery, if you're in a state that has lottery, are one to the hundreds of millions. And that if you buy one ticket, it could be one to 400 million. If you buy two tickets, it doesn't actually improve your odds any. But I know whenever I'm someplace else that has a lottery, I usually buy more than one ticket, at least a couple. Well, that's also the same reason that I ski with an avalanche airbag pack most days. 
it can't hurt to have it. They're great. They work really well if you need them and use them in the right instance. Um, Avalon's another uh, product from Black Diamond that can really also, if you do get buried, can help you from dying from asphyxiation. Um, Reco chips are another thing. There's a lot of professional rescue resources that have a, it's a radar unit that can find a chip that's either buried, sewn into your backpack or maybe your ski boot and they can come find you with that also. So that's gear, those are all just bonus points, but don't ever leave home without your transceiver, shovel, and probe. Um, again, something that you'll learn if you do take a level one class or a level two class, uh, which also, like the point to emphasize is it, it's important to practice. Uh, beacon, uh, your avalanche beacon, your transceiver, works in a very specific way. The radio signal that comes out of it, the one that you're searching for, moves, travels actually in a curved path, not in a straight line. If, if you don't know that, you could find that searching for one of these transceivers really difficult. So it's important to practice and get some education and practice with your tools so you know how to use it. There's also things like dig from the downhill side. Uh, an important part of avalanche education these days is strategic shoveling. Uh, my, my, my dad, thanks dad, always joked that if I didn't pay attention in school, I was going to end up digging ditches. And I totally consider myself to be an expert level shoveler. Uh, it's something I train all the time. Uh, it's important to be able to do it. But if you have the right tactics and techniques, you're going to be much more effective at it and not just dig a huge hole in the ground. You'll actually be able to rescue your buddy. So again, uh, gear only works if you practice a lot. Um, I start my season, my first three or four tours of the season are mostly rescue practice. When I was a ski patroller, rookie ski patrollers, we would have them practicing beacon drills uh, at least once or twice a week, shoveling drills definitely once a week. Um, these skills are all really hard, but because I have that much repetition, it doesn't take much tune-up for me to get in the swing of things again at the beginning of the season, but I still do it anyways. It's, it's really important to practice. Um, even hard skills, which you know these are hard skills, uh, they're perishable. If we don't use them, we will lose them, um, which is why you know, I go out at the beginning of the season with a group of partners and we all have the same agenda those first couple tours of the year, and that's gonna be practice our rescue skills. So, you know, the big takeaway is without, without transceiver shovel probe, uh, your odds of uh, you being, the odds of you being rescued if you're buried or you being able to rescue one of your friends, the odds of that happening are really low. So that's why get the gears. Uh, the first part of this. Um, you know, if you think back to uh, when I was talking about after 15 minutes, your odds of survival are in the low single digits. Um, search and rescue, there's a lot of great search and rescue resources all over the country. Um, a, a big search and rescue mobilization usually is gonna take about two hours. Um, and that's two hours if you're buried in an avalanche you don't have. It's gonna be a body recovery. So. That part's super important. Um, you know, another high profile thing we see a lot are the avalanche rescue dogs that uh, most of them are based out of ski areas around the West. Uh, the avalanche rescue dogs are, are super cool. If you've ever seen your local ski patrol doing a rescue drill with a dog, it's one of the cooler things that you'll ever see. These dogs can move unbelievably fast through really difficult terrain. And the way they, they can follow a scent and the passion that these dogs have for saving people, it's really impressive. Don't ever hesitate to go ask a ski patroller if there's an avalanche dog and when could you watch them train someday maybe. It's a pretty cool thing. Again though, how long does it take an avalanche rescue dog to get into the backcountry? Well, it's a search and rescue resource. It can take a very long time. Uh, it's definitely not something I ever count on as a good part of a rescue plan. You know, and keep in mind too, a lot of the best riding that, uh, that we all wanna do, like, I mean, let's face it, like, if you're listening to this, you like, you like riding powder, right? I mean, that's, that's, that's what I love doing. But good powder usually comes on storm days. Uh, one of the fastest ways uh, resources, search and rescue resources are gonna get to you in the back country is by helicopter. Helicopters don't fly on storm days, so keep that in mind. 
Um, so get the training. Um, this is, you know, people were skiing backcountry for a long time before we had really cool avalanche airbag packs and great, all these great uh, transceivers and modern tools and everything, but they had really good training. Um, if you're watching this and curious about getting some more education, uh, if you live in Utah, you can go to utahavalanchecenter.org slash education. Uh, we have links there to all the different education providers throughout Utah. There's a bunch of them. Um, a couple of them are, do operate nationally. So if you're watching this anywhere in the Western US, uh, ARI, the American Institute for Avalanche Research and Education, and AAI, the American Avalanche Institute, both run great classes all over the Mountain West. Uh, I think Aries even branched out some on the East Coast. So East Coasters, you know, you're not, you're not out to dry on this one. You can get in on the action too. Uh, maybe throw in a comment if you wanna try and win a free class. Thank you, Backcountry. But what you'll learn in that class, um, I talked about the different recipes for avalanches. So yeah, we'll teach you how these different avalanches occur. Um, the, you know, how to evaluate not just the snowpack for the snow that's already on the ground, but the, the weather um, and all kinds of, uh, let's call it psychology, the psychology of backcountry skiing and how to stay safe. So again, if you're curious about this, if you go to uh, the avalanche.org, you can find links to all this stuff. Um, there's also get the forecast. So I keep talking about all these different forecast centers that do a great job uh, in the US. They're all tremendous. You can get to them, again, all through avalanche.org. Uh, here in Utah, it's utahavalanchecenter.org. But their only function, like I said earlier, their only function is to get you the information that you need to stay safe in the backcountry. Um, it, you know, we're doing everything we can to get that information out there, um, you know, be it apps or uh, websites. Uh, we still, Utah Avalanche Center even still has a, a phone hotline. If you want to send us a fax, send us a fax. Um, a lot of different forecast centers these days are also reaching out on social media. Follow them on social media. The information to stay safe it's there and it's really good information. So there's really no excuse for not reaching out and grabbing it. Um, so uh, another important thing, there's a, the, the tool that these forecast centers use to tell you how dangerous things are gonna be is called the North American Public Avalanche Danger Scale. Um, at its simplest, it's color coded from uh, the extreme danger level, which is black, down to high, considerable, moderate, and low that have corresponding colors all the way down to green for low. Um, but sometimes that can be taking a really complex, you know, it's, it's really easy for us to look at this color and make an assumption about the day. But keep in mind that they're trying to synthesize sometimes a whole lot of information that can be kind of complex down into one word and one color. So they all use, all the different forecast centers, all use the North American Public Avalanche Danger Scale, so it's important to know how to read it also. Um, I spend a lot of time, every time I write a forecast in the morning, um, I always, I have a reference and I open up the North American Public Avalanche Danger Scale and I make sure that I'm using uh, the, uh, the terms correctly. So another important thing to know about the public avalanche danger scale, um, you know, we get used to seeing these colors. And if you're, if you're a good backcountry user, you read the forecast every day so you can kind of start figuring out what to expect for the following day. Um, but as we watch it get more dangerous as a storm comes through and then the uh, avalanche danger starts to drop off as the storm passes through and things stabilize a little bit, the danger level can change. Well, keep in mind that these things, these different hazard ratings that we talk about, they're independent from each other. So you have to read them independently. If we've been through a storm cycle here and maybe we had a day of extreme and two days of high and you, know, you were skiing at or riding at the resort and things are starting to come down now and maybe the avalanche danger is just at considerable, it starts to feel kind of good, like, well, Ah, considerable, like that's not, that's not great, but uh, well, it's not higher extreme. So yeah, let's go, let's go out this gate and go ride some pow. 
Well, that's actually where most avalanche accidents happen, is at considerable rating. It's uh, almost 40, yeah, 47%. So almost all fatalities happen there. So that's a sign right there. If it's a considerable day, you know, it's kind of at that, uh, right at that middle ground of it's not really dangerous, but it's also not really stable. So be careful on those days. Um, also part of get the picture, what I was talking about, putting all these different little, little things together, not just your gear, not just the forecast, but also when you get out into the mountains, looking around and grabbing these clues. I talked about earlier, if you grew up on the beach, you can probably look at the water and go, okay, okay yeah, I get it, there's a, there's a little rip current over here, we probably shouldn't go over that way. Well, in the mountains, the same way. Uh, sometimes you'll see uh, it's really common to look at a slope and see a bunch of tracks in it, and it kind of makes you feel good, right? Well, you know, 10 other people rode that line. Yeah, you know, it doesn't really fit in with the forecast for the day, but let's go ride that line. There's signs like that. That doesn't necessarily mean that that slope is safe. There's a couple different avalanche problems where that slope might be very dangerous, but, well, nobody stepped in quite the right spot. So that's one of those signs you'd, you know, start training yourself to look for. So big takeaway point here, the most obvious sign of avalanche danger, the number one sign that you can be sure there's potential for avalanches on any given day are other avalanches. Seems kind of seems obvious to say, but the reality is in a lot of accident reports from avalanche accidents, um, you know, victims and survivors will say things like, well, yeah, you know, we read the forecast and we had seen other avalanches that day, but, you know, we, did, we thought where we were going, eh, it was going to be safe. So another one of the signs to look out for as you travel in the backcountry, if you see avalanches occurring in the backcountry, the best place to go is home. So we talk about, that's number one of five red flags that we talk about. So Number one red flag is recent avalanches on similar slopes. Uh, cracking and collapsing is a more subtle sign of instability that a lot of people can, can miss. Uh, cracking and collapsing, if you've ever experienced it in the backcountry, can come with a, a loud audible whoomph. And sometimes the snow on a slope will whoomph and crack and move just a little bit. Well, what that was was an avalanche that just needed a couple more degrees of slope angle. So really, number two, cracking and collapsing as a red flag is the same as number one. Um, really, if you have a slope crack and collapse, two more degrees maybe of slope angle and you would have made an avalanche. So really, if you see cracking and collapsing, it's time to go home. Uh, wind drifted snow. Uh, frequently, uh, you know, even days after a storm, you know, we could be out in, traveling in the backcountry and if you can see, if you can feel wind, or even if you're living uh, down in a valley like the Salt Lake Valley, you don't have to be able to feel wind in the valley. You can look on your forecast or even just check the news and see what the winds high up are doing. Uh, even without any new snow, high winds can transport new snow onto leeward slopes and uh, raise the avalanche danger on them. So if you see snow moving across ridgetops, know that that's a big red flag too. New snow, right? Snowpack, we say, snowpack doesn't like rapid change, okay? Um, so really, what the last point I talked about, wind-drifted snow, really that's rapid change, right? It's wind moving snow and adding to the load on the leeward side uh, snowpack. Um, uh, that this rapid change can also come in the form of new snow. Um, as much as we all want to go ride some really good pow, uh, if, if you think it's gonna be a great powder day and it's mid-storm and you go out to your car and you gotta spend 20 minutes cleaning your car off before you go anywhere, you may not have even checked the forecast yet, but guaranteed the avalanche danger on that day is gonna be elevated. Um, last one uh, is also a form of rapid change that a snowpack's not gonna like, rapid thaw. Um, the, the day to look out for this is when, like maybe you get up in the early in the morning uh, and it's, you know, in the springtime and it's 19 degrees outside and you put on every piece of puffy clothing you had to go meet your partners at the trailhead to go ride in the backcountry, but the day's high in the mountains is supposed to be in the mid-40s. 
Well, that's a kind of rapid change that the snowpack also isn't going to like. Um, not just the temperature, but the solar input from the sun can also help rapidly destabilize uh, solar aspect slopes. So uh, get out of harm's way. I, I, I still think this is one of the easiest, most valuable things that anybody could learn in avalanche education. Uh, there is etiquette to it. Uh, you always want to ride slopes one at a time. If you're in a party of four and three people are riding the slope at the same time and it avalanches, one person now has three to rescue. That's, that's bad odds. I would not bet on that horse. But if one person at a time is on the slope, you have one person on the slope, there's an avalanche, that one person now has three rescuers. Way better odds. Um, also, get out of the way at the bottom of the path. Um, with, uh, you know, as cell phone cameras have gotten better, as GoPros have become more ubiquitous, uh, people really like to stop at the bottom of a line and take pictures of their friend riding it. Um, not a good idea. Get out of the way, go to a safe spot, take a class, learn how to identify these safe spots. But, you know, I talked about it earlier, some days it's going to be the day to go bowling, not go ride in the back country. Um, train your eyes to start judging slope angles too. This is something that you'll learn uh, as you take more classes. Um, and know how to quantify them also. I've, I've been a professional avalanche worker for uh, almost 20 years now, and I've found that my, my estimate on slope angles has about a 10 degree uh, margin of error on it. It's really, I, I'm not even that good at it, and this is what I do for a, a living. So if you think I'm bad at it, you know, if you have fewer days in you, you're probably even rustier at it than I am. So know how to quantify these slope angles also. Under 30 degrees, kind of call that green light terrain. Um, it's going to be really hard to create an avalanche on a less than 30 degree slope. Uh, also know how to look at the, evaluate the slopes that are adjacent to where you're riding. Because just because you're on a 17 degree slope doesn't mean you're underneath or within range of a 40 degree slope. So, you know, keep in mind slope angle is not just where you're riding, but what's around you also. Um, above about 50 degrees, avalanches are actually really rare. Uh, because the snow continually sheds off them. Uh, we, it's sometimes really fun to ski these really steep slopes, but past 50 degrees, for the most, tar for the most part, we're talking about alpine climbing and ice climbing. So it's not really going to be fun skiing anyways. So train your eyes for that just right 30 to 45 degree slope angles. This is where most avalanches occur. And start getting used to uh, seeing those. So also get used to looking for different types of avalanche problems can show you different types of surface textures. This is a really subtle thing that, uh, you know, gaining this knowledge really only comes with time. Um, so when you are out riding in the backcountry, stop every now and then, take a look around at the surface of the snow around you, see how it feels and see how hard it is, and start training your eyes up to be able to evaluate that stuff. Before you ride a slope also, something that's uh, a, a risk multiplier are the cons potential consequences of where uh, an avalanche is going to take you. Is it going to take you into a gully? Are there trees it's going to rake you through? Are there cliffs, rocks, and crevasses that it's going to take you into? Or is it just flat out a really big path that could potentially slide? Um, frequently in avalanche accidents, these are going to be uh, what ultimately uh, end up turning a good day in the backcountry into a uh, possible fatality or injury. As the backcountry gets more crowded, uh, it's a, a slow trend that uh, we've noticed over the last about 10 years uh, that I think is going to be a really big hazard this year is crowded backcountry. Are you putting other people at risk? Uh, just recently on Teton Pass in Wyoming in the last couple of years, there have been a number of rider-triggered avalanches that have hit cars on an open road. Um, you do have a responsibility, not just to yourself and your, and your touring partner, but other people that could be out there. Um, none of us live on an island as much as we'd like to think we do. Your, your actions can intertwine others. So make sure there's nobody below you also before you ride a line. 
uh, take a look around. Um, also consider that if you get into an accident in the backcountry and search and rescue has to come get you, you're also exposing them to potential hazards. So keep in mind that bigger picture of who else is out there in the backcountry. So as I wrap this up, uh, we're getting to the end of it, of, of all the like me talking and telling you all these like really scary, really dangerous things and all these horrible things could happen to you. I don't want this to, to scare people away from the backcountry. If anything, we're all better off with more people in the backcountry uh, for lots of reasons. It's good for the industry, it's good for you know, we could help protect our public lands. This is where most backcountry skiing is done. So there's all kinds of great reasons to have more people out there. So I want you to come out into the backcountry. It is doable, but you gotta get some education. Uh, there's, there's so many great education resources out there. Um, it's a great place to go learn things and challenge yourself and see some amazing places and ride some excellent POW too. It is doable. I mean, I do this hundreds of days a year for, for a profession, and well, I, it's working for me. So get the education, get the gear, you know, get the training, get the picture, get all these things together, ask questions, be curious. It's a really neat world, but come out there, get it all together, and come join me in the backcountry. It's a neat place. <laughs>